What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. We got on a special guest tonight, so excited to bring him on here in just a second. Uh, but before we do, I want to let y'all know about my good friend Eric Williams with Eric Williams Realty. Uh, he's helping my wife and I right now look for a piece of property to build a house on, hopefully next year or two. Um, but does all kinds of uh, real estate as far as commercial, residential, um, and, and even if you're just looking for land like we are. So um, give him uh, give him a shout if you're looking to sell or buy a house or property or anything like that. Um, I'll have all his stuff linked in the in the description uh, on the YouTube channel as well as on the show notes of the podcast platforms. Um, but I'm not going to do too much of this pre-show jabber tonight. We're going to get right into the topic. I'm going to bring on my good buddy, good buddy through talking over social media, old Justin Carter here. What's going on, man? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. For sure. Merry Christmas. That's one thing I forgot to say while we were talking before we even did this. It's Once Christmas kind of comes and leaves, it's like I, it's out of my mind. You know, it's all, all you can think about at first and then but you're still kind of on your on your Christmas rounds, aren't you? Yeah, I'm still still traveling. Uh, head back towards home tomorrow, but it's been a weird Christmas. It's hard to get into the Christmas mood some years when it's in the 70s all yeah, the time. Golly. It's nice. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I I snow. I'm good without it. But you know, a little bit of cool weather might might help bring on that. Uh, Christmas spirit a little earlier in the season. I agree. I agree. It's it's like Christmas was here along with 80 degree weather for the whole week. So um, I I don't know if you've looked at the weather and if you're seeing it, but it, it dropped a little bit. But yesterday when I was looking at the forecast, it was like gust to 60 on like Sunday. I think it was. I saw. Yeah, I saw one down there. It's pretty good. That we're gonna we're gonna see a little bit of a, a downturn in the temperature. But yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'll be on the water that day. No, I, I think won't. That's going to be a little much. I won't either. Sixty <laughs> miles per hour. That's my. I cut it off there. I don't. I don't go fishing if it's over sixty. <laughs> yeah, I don't even think the, the the protected creeks will keep me out of the wind on that. No, one. no, not at all, not at all. Well, guys, tonight we're going to talk with Justin, just kind of about. So he's he's located in Charleston, right? Charleston proper. Yep, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and so we're going to just talk about his winter fishery there and kind of what he does throughout the winter. Um, and, and excited to talk about that because. Though it is very similar to where we are in North Carolina and where some of our listeners are in Georgia and Virginia, um, it is there's so much that you can pull from it, but it's also very different. And and so I think that you know we can learn from from both the differences and the similarities as we talk about his his wintertime fishing. But um, we'll kind of get going into that. So kind of I know that you've been on this podcast a long time ago. I was supposed to be on it as well, but I was sick, and so I, I can't even remember what it was. I was either sick or something happened in the family, but. Um, Kind of give people your backstory a little bit, how you started uh, chartering and, and kind of how it's brought you to where you are today before we get going. So, I, I mean, like most people in the industry, I've been fishing pretty much my whole life, whether it's been freshwater bass pond fishing as a kid or, you know, going down and fishing blue water, surf fishing. At one point, I was even a pier rat. Um, you know, I, I even kinged fish for off off piers off the coast here that wasn't the most successful thing i've ever done lots of waiting for very few bites right but, i mean i've i've kind of done it all uh really got into fishing again pretty hard um in my kind of early mid-20s um got into kayak fishing again you know just got tired of relying on buddies to get me out wasn't in a, an area where i could have a boat um or at a point in my life where I was ready to, to invest in it and decide to get into kayak fishing and got into tournament fishing um, shortly thereafter and was fairly successful at it, um, provided a lot of opportunities for me, opened some doors, traveled, got to be a part of the U.S. team for several years, uh, Australia, Europe, uh, won the U.S. Um, and then as far as the guiding, um, you know, over the years, people just saying, Hey man, take me fishing, take me fishing. Hey, take me fishing, take me fishing. And after a while it just kind of clicked. There's never a thought process or a goal in my life to become a charter fisherman. But you know, you get asked so many times like, man, I might as well try to get paid to do this. Right. And, and I ran a kayak charter business for a while, very successful one. Um, but it was never going to be enough to pay my bills completely. I was having to pull double duty and, and kind of my late mid to late twenties got to a point where I went, you know what, if I'm going to make this work, I'm going to have to make the jump. Um, I'd worked on a head boat, you know, years ago, had plenty of experience out on boats, but just 
decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump and we're gonna give it a go. And if it doesn't work, I'll go do something else. And fishing will always be a part of my life. But I really want to see if I can do what I love for a living. And, for and sure. fortunately enough, I've been successful with it. And you know, I've got a, a great great group of guys that I work with and I've got a good following of customers and it it allows me to share what I love with people day in and day out. You know, most days, most days don't feel like work, but you do it. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, for sure. There's a few days you're like, man, I might not should get out of bed today. (laughs) Some days feel like work, but at least you're still outside. Yeah, definitely, man. That's cool. I love that story because it's, I feel like I have a lot of respect for when, when people just are kind of like found by Like so many people will go out and try too hard, not try too hard, but just seek out the job too much because it's like this cool job. You want to be a fishing guide. You want to, you know, have, I don't know. I don't want to diss that too much, but guys like you where, you know, you just fish and your fishing just took you to where you are. It's not like you really pushed it too hard. You just, you're a good, really good fisherman and it just made sense for you to be a fishing guide. So uh, that's And I don't regret it, man. I'm I'm very happy that I get to do it. It's, It's truly rewarding and you know you know i got some buddies some other guides that you know like, oh man i got a, i got some little kids today or something right. and for me that's that's the trip i'm probably going to try the hardest on when we have the little kid right. because i know what fishing did for me in my life and if i could create that spark or provide that experience for that child who knows what it'll do for them for the rest of their life and it's, it's cool to know that i might be a part of molding that process yeah, man, definitely. I, I think that's one of the, the coolest and biggest responsibilities we have as fishing guides is creating that next generation. Uh, and that's why sometimes I get nervous when a dad calls and he's like, hey, I've got a, my seven-year-old son and I wanted, he doesn't want to fish, but I want to bring him on a fly fishing trip, um, a full-day fly fishing trip. And I'm like, I would love to take <laughs> you and your son fishing, but this might not be the day to like try to get him into, into fishing. So... Um, you know, how are you on the fly fishing? I, I'm still talking spinning rod. Right, I'm right. Probably bait the seven year old. Oh, for sure. No, that that's what I'm saying is I don't want to do. I'd rather be like, hey, let's go grab some bait. We'll go hit some docks and some schools of redfish. And um, but no, man, I, I love taking kids fishing. That's my favorite part of the job is being able to get kids out there and get them get them fired up about it. Um, so that's super cool. And, and kind of back to what you were saying too, you know. I think if I'd have, if I had known that I could have done this for a living earlier in life, man, I I, I might have tried to do it right, right. differently um, and might have had a different goal with it. But you know, it just it's just how it found me. You for know what sure. I mean? It just it I don't know how to say it. It found me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, that's awesome. That's uh that's super cool, man. There's there's a uh, a lot of fishing guides out there, man. But there's you know there's 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 a lot of good fishing guides too. But there's there's people that you know, really are, are good at the whole bit of it. There's people that are really good at fishing and there's people that are really good at guiding and then there's people that kind of can meld the two together well. And and I feel like you're definitely one of those guys. So that's super cool. Well, let's let's talk about kind of what, give me a little, give me a picture of your guide business and, and give a shout out to your guide business and, and, and whatnot so we can, and I'll link all of your information as well as I was talking about Eric's um, in the show notes in the description on YouTube so people can find that. Um, so, we're uh, we're out of Charleston, South Carolina. It's Red Fin Charters, mm-hmm. InshoreFishingCharters.com. Um, we are one of the larger now charter companies uh, on the East Coast and probably in the U.S. We're, we're pushing as a company over twenty five hundred charters a year. Uh, um, we run out of blackjack boats. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, they're a rather unique style bay boat. They're almost reminiscent of a, a sporty squatted the hulls almost kind of a sporty hole squatted down into a bay boat you know flat back very steep sharp entry in the front big flare um great riding boats we have the 256 which is our larger of the two two models and we have the 224 and then we also run a couple of hell's bay watermans for our fly fishing and guided trips and we'll be adding for 2023 i have a uh, 42 freeman um, nice. to get back into the offshore game that's um, awesome but as far as what we fish for um man if it's swimming and it's worth targeting a lot of the year and it's available i'm gonna do it um i love doing cobia um it is one of my favorite things to do i, I, I we have a unique fishery here at least as far as my understanding of it that we i can target them almost year round um, that's awesome can you still find cobia right now this time of year 
or is this? I the... probably won't find very many, and I'm gonna have to work to do it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think I got like 108 this year. Nice. That's awesome. Um, and that's out of a 25 and a half foot bay boat, so I'm very limited on the number of days that I can get out there and do it. Right. Um, but we have the traditional migration, like most people think of, that south to north. And, you know, back down to the south, north from the south. But mm -hmm. uh, we also have a uh, second population of fish here that migrate from east to west and then back west to east. Mm -hmm. And through D our Department of Natural Resources, uh, they have confirmed what some of us have suspected for years, that we had that population. And they're finding that they're wintering out as deep as 400 or 500 feet of water wow. instead of traveling south. They did find that some of the fish, you know, intermingled. Um, and if a group, uh, you know, a fish from our population runs into a fish, group of fish running north, they will jump on and or a fish coming north might find our fish and jump into that population. So you do have mixing populations, but it does allow me to have the spring bite like most people get, you know, starting sometime April, maybe as early as March if you get lucky. Um, I can go out to the deeper water. Um, starting in March and start to find them again, pushing back in, depending on the temperature. And that migration bite runs to about mid July. And then after that, you know, I'm catching my cobia from 80 up to 120. Um, the last one I caught was early December, um, but I just haven't been out uh, to do it since. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of people on the East coast, you know, we have a great bull redfish bite. We have a great inshore redfish bite. Speckled trout, flounder, sheep's head, black drum, sharks of all shapes and sizes, you know, from your little Atlantic shark nose all the way up to your tiger sharks and hammerheads. Um, then kingfish, snapper, grouper. I mean, you name it, man. I'm I'm targeting it. And that's part of what helps keep it fresh for me. For sure. Is having that ability where I'm not specializing in one thing. Because I've done the flats boat. I've done the offshore mahi thing and tuna and whatnot, and I did it in a smaller boat, you know, 34 before, and I just was a little small, which is why we're stepping into the bigger one now. But having that diversity really helps keep it fresh. It definitely it helps does. keep it easy for me to get excited each day when we're going to do something rather than saying, "Hey, we're going for redfish today," or you know right. what I mean, just day in and day out. For sure. That's something I really struggle with, man. When I my first four or five years guiding, like all I targeted was redfish. And I was so burnt out. Like I almost took a job selling boats. Someone offered me a job and I was like, you know what? That sounds good. I, you know, it's got, I'll, it'll be, my insurance will be covered. And I was like, what am I thinking? Like, this is not what I want to do. I don't want to go sell boats to people that are going to go spend time on the water while I'm sitting here selling so boats. Talk. Fish, yeah. Exactly. I was like, that's, I, why am I thinking this? And so that's when I started, like I bought, I bought a bigger boat as well as my skiff and started diversifying. And, and then you just have so many more things to learn. Like I feel like so many people, and, and when you first get into saltwater fishing, it can be good to like pick a species or something to, to try to learn and, and, and to figure out because it can be a little overwhelming to try to do a lot. But the more time you spend, the more you realize like, wow, that's cool that we have all these different types of fish and deep water and shallow water and all this stuff to figure out. Makes you a better angler overall, I think, to try to learn it all. Still trying to figure it all out, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> that, that's, that's what I love. That's part about this. You'll never figure it all out. And just when you think you do, you know, this is the only sport in the world that you ask a live animal to actively choose to participate in for you to be successful. So no matter what you or I do, right. they got to choose to eat. For sure. You can't make them do it. And it can be kind of tough to, to make them choose to eat this time of year. So maybe that can, there's our topic right there is how to make fish eat in the winter. All, all shapes and sizes. So you, you kind of taken us through your seasons and whatnot. So let, let's jump into the winter time. So what is a, you know, if you're looking at the weather forecast and, and you see, you know, you could kind of go do whatever, the wind's going to be light. Like, what does your day look like if you've got a full day trip? What do you kind of try to fit into a, a full day? So for a full day, um, I like to go do the sheep's head bite, which yeah. is just now getting, I kind of, I don't really target them unless I get a customer that specifically asks to do it for the rest of the year. But from kind of mid-December through that second week of April, the sheep's head have moved out or are currently moving out. It's a little been a little bit warm, so I, there's been a slower push this yeah, winter for sure. where they haven't all pushed out yet. Um, but they move out to areas anywhere from about 25 out to about 60 feet of water, um, and they congregate out there to aggregate spawn for the winter. 
So for the rest of the year, let's say you're targeting a sheep's head and you're going to pull up to a dock. Let's hypothetically, let's say there's 10 sheep's head on that dock. If you've sheep's head fish before, you go one for four on your bites, you're not doing too bad. Right. Um, but if there's 10 fish under that dock, man, you're, you're spending time jumping. And for customers, especially if they've never done it, telling them that they go one for four on their bites can be often frustrating for someone. Right. So it's a big reason I don't target them most of the rest of the year. However, now we're pulling up on structures where you could have 50, 100, 200 fish. Right. And it's straight up and down vertical fishing, almost like snapper. Right. We're still using the same traditional sheep's head baits. Um, but if you go one for four, man, there's another 75 to 100 fish down there. Right, right. Um, that you're going to get shots at. And it can be some of the best bites. I'd say our average fish this time of year runs about four pounds um, with there's going to be some sixes, sevens, eights. And you're going to have a shot, you know, for out there for six, eight hours. There's going to be some shots at that 10 plus pound sheep's head. You're just going to have to capitalize on the bite when it comes. And, you know, every now and then, too, you think you hook the bottom and you hooked into a 50 to 90 pound black drum on a <laughs> sheep's head rig, which could be quite entertaining. Yeah, for sure. Do you all have a decent amount of those bigger black drum that winter down, down by you? I, I see them in the spring, early spring for the spawn. Um, I will occasionally target them in the spawn, um, you know, in the channels, um, on the mouth of the harbor or around the bridges and stuff like that. You got a good shot at some bigger ones. Um, but the, the truly big, big giant ones, um, I have yet to find an area um, where I can consistently target them inshore right. they seem to uh seem to show up randomly um at the reefs and whatnot and you can mark them like i can often if they're there i can tell by the size of the mark and where they're sitting um just from history that that's probably going to be a group of giant black drum yeah and if that's the case a lot of times i'll bring blue crab out with me um and have a heavier rod to try to specifically target them rather than you know, give somebody a little 3,500 and a seven foot medium fast, right. 20 pound test and <laughs> Hold let on. hang on for 45 minutes. All right. That, that's awesome. Yeah. I would say it's the same with us up here with those big, big, big black drum is so inconsistent. There's spots that like definitely they'll is where you'll catch them and you'll bump into them. But it, it's like, we've seen them every time yeah, of the year and, and we've also, you know, hooked a lot of them different times, summer and winter, but it's, you can go there one day and have fish on it and the next day they're, they're not there. So. I mean, the 20 to like 40 pound, 45 pound fish, I feel like in target, but once they seem to cross that 50 pound mark, I don't see them yeah. consistently. Yeah, they're just like solo cows wandering around. <laughs> just grazing around. Big, 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 ugly fish. Big, ugly fish. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, with your sheep's head fishing, and you said traditional sheep's head baits. What are your, you know, and everywhere can be different. I'm guessing it's probably the same as here though. Take me through like your rig as well as what kind of baits you're using to target those fish. And also talk so, about with those so for, baits, what else that opens up for you to catch out there this time of year. So for your bait, um, my favorite, like most everybody else, is going to be the Fiddler Crab. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Fiddler Crab prices have gone up there for you, but man, the last four or five years, they seem to have absolutely skyrocketed. Do you uh, buy them from a shop so there? It, I, if, if I have to. Yeah, gotcha. I actually, and this is something I want to make clear to anybody listening, that if you go do this, please be responsible and repair the ground that you're doing it in. Yeah. I will actually dig my fiddler crabs. They're still in their holes. You know, they're, they're not, they're hibernating, they're inactive, but they're still there. So if you've got a good sandy bottom area where you don't have a lot of grass, this is where you're not digging up the marsh grass. Right, if you've right, got right. a sandy area, um, I'll take a shovel and I'll dig them up and hand pick them. Um, I also tend to get bigger fiddler crabs doing it this way a lot of times than what the store, the store will sell. Um, but make sure you cover your holes back up. Don't leave them. Don't leave the ground all tore up. Try to repair what you've done and try not to take you know, more than you need. But digging them for me, it might be a little bit more work. But in a couple hours, I could get, I don't know, five, six hundred plus. Yeah. Um, and enough to run a few, you know, several trips out of. Yeah. Um, 
but on an average six hour charter, I'm going to go through probably 200 fiddler crabs. Yeah. Um, between the customers figuring out the bite, you know, understanding how light that bite can be and what it feels like. And then just, you know, whether it's fish we're not targeting, like the sea bass, um, you know, that'll hit your baits, even pin fish that are out at the reefs this time of year will hit them. Um, ringtail porgies, we've got red, juvenile red snapper, grouper, juvenile grouper on them, um, regular redfish, black drum, yeah. giant black drum, like we talked about. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that I've come across over the year. I mean, I've caught, come across some, some pretty random stuff. I caught a trigger head last, or a trigger head, a trigger fish last year, um, in 35 feet, it was wow. like six pounds. God, and that was cool. a little bit of a surprise, but I mean, just if it, if it's swimming in any kind of predator down there, man, the, the fiddler crab for me works the best. It does. Because these fish have moved out into the ocean. They don't have access to them anymore. And I always equate it to like dropping a crack rock to a crack attic, man. They jump all over they do. real quick. They definitely And if do. you're not getting bit by the right species, you know, you're not getting what you want, pick up and move. Don't sit there and wait because these fish are all over structure this time of year. And some groups may not be ready to eat versus others. Other baits that we like to use, you know, I've used live shrimp, um, but just like it is inshore, it's very difficult to hook a, uh, a sheep's head on live shrimp. However, we do tend to catch big ones using live shrimp because I believe that they're big enough to inhale it yeah. rather than picking the bait clean. But you can go through bukus of live shrimp yeah, trying to target them using live shrimp. Um, I've used... Uh, periwinkles in a pinch, they do work. They're not as effective, mm-hmm. um, but they are readily available and easy to grab. Go get out on a flat and just start scooping them up. Um, I've used clams, um, and I will use a nylon mesh bag for those um, and secure it to the hook. That way, the sheep's head can't, or another fish can't pick it clean faster than I can, you know, hook into them. Right, right. Um, I know some guys will use oysters. I don't like the oysters because even with the nylon mesh, which is a super fine mesh, they still squeeze through the bag and it's soft it's enough just to a, kind of work little, through it. Yeah, it's a little messier. Um, and then I've used whole mussels. Oh, cool. Um, and that is a way to target really big ones. And that's an, a little bit more patience on that bite um, because they've got to crush it and then suck it in. And you've got to let them suck it in after the bite. Yeah, I wouldn't be good at that one. <laughs> I'm not patient um, enough. Yeah, no, it, it's it's not it's not the easiest one to do, but you, it's another way to target much bigger sheep's head. For um, sure. The uh, <clears throat> another technique, just like inshore, for those of you who've done it before and scrape pilings. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of what I like to do is I chum offshore, and I'll take a traditional chum bag like you would use for you know, whatever you're trying to chum for, whether it's cobia or whatever else you're going to use a chum bag for offshore. And I take, and I go to like our bridges at low tide and I'll take a bucket and a two by four and knock mussels and oysters into my bucket. And then I go back to the dock and I take that two by four and I crush all of those oysters up. And then I bring them out in a bucket and then I'll take them and I'll have like an offshore style, uh, heavy rod, and secure it to the rod and I will drop it off the front of the boat and put it in a rod holder and allow the wave action of the boat to agitate that bag up and down. And a lot of times that'll help bring the fish to me as well. Yeah, get that um, scent. Even on days where it's too rough and let's say my trolling motor doesn't work for a lot of you, if you don't use them, don't have it, get a trolling motor spot lock. It's the easiest way to do this. But if you do anchor, and you know how tough it is where you get set up and you're right on it and then you get a wind direction change or a little bit of a current change and next thing you know you're off the structure um i've even i've had it happen where even off the structure we'll pull the fish off the structure out onto the sand wow. and catch them behind the bags and it you know an hour maybe before you need to freshen it up and then you just dump the rest of it out and dump it on there and it helps bring everything in and get everything stirred up um you know one of the big differences between us we're very similar to georgia in this regard but 
maybe not so much North Carolina and Virginia, is the level of tide that we have here. I think that's one of the major differences that we experience that you guys don't have. Mm -hmm. You guys have tide. Right. Don't get me wrong. But you guys, what's your average tide? Average tide is like three and a half feet. You know, and then three and, a half and then on a big tide, it's five. Tide, five and a half, six is my average. Right. Bigger tides, eight to nine. Yeah, a uh, lot feet of, of water movement. Water. That's a lot of moving water. And even when you're offshore or near shore fishing for sheephead, that plays a role. That current, even though we don't see the water level drop because we have nothing to relate it to, it still happens. Yeah, yeah. And you get heavy levels of current. Now, when you're targeting sheep's head out on these reefs, it can be tougher to target them during the bore, during the peak part of the tide. Yeah. Um, if you have a bigger tide, smaller tides, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to affect them as much. But during the heavy peak flow periods, um, I do notice that I'm going to have to get on the back side of the structure and try to get my baits down, maybe use a little bit heavier lead um, than I would otherwise. Um, as far as our rigs, uh, seven foot medium fast action rod is my preferred. Mm -hmm. Seven and a half is nice. I think a seven and a half, preferably, I tend to go to longer rods. I still have a strong butt. A little bit smaller tip on that seven and a half medium, so I have a little bit more sensitive. Right. Um, I fish St. Croix. I does. I'm not going to tell you you have to have a St. Croix to do this. That's obviously not true. But I tend to use a little bit nicer rod. Um, you know, something with an um, they grade it in SC rating, so an SC three graphite, something like the Abbott Inshore, um, where I have a little bit more sensitive material in the rod and stronger backbone, so I could feel that bite. But enough backbone, you know, to get that bigger fish up. Right. Correct. Um, but I'm using a 3500 uh, series reel. Um, you know, drag's not that crazy. You know, I don't want to have the drag locked down super tight because you don't want to bust them. I tend to use about 18 to 24 inches of 20 pound fluorocarbon mm -hmm. for my leader, um, and then typically a one aught octopus live bait hook okay um i will use one with a little bit thicker gauge but not too thick um because i don't want my crab to fall apart if i'm using fiddler crabs if i you know that bigger thicker hook if i pierce Cracks that crab it. with that hook i can crack the shell open but i have found that on your biggest sheep's head i have had them bite through hooks wow literally bite the hooks in half um so i tend to step up the hook a little bit and then as far as lead Anywhere from half ounce upwards of one and a half. If I got to use two ounces because of the current, it's probably too much. Right. It's right. Probably, the current's probably rolling too hard. Um, but and then my main line is going to be braid, probably thirty pound, thirty pound braid. Thirty pound braid. Um, I, you get away with twenty, but thirty pounds what I prefer. I also utilize a lot of the same rods to do other things with. So for sure, I try to keep it keep it to where it's the best for all of my options and all the fishing styles that I like to do. Um, if you're going to use, I mean, if you're going to use shrimp, the hook doesn't change. It doesn't, you know, I, I tail hook most of my shrimp or head hook them. Um, I don't hook my shrimp though. Like most people, I hook them through the mouth and out the top in front of the, the, the brain. Yeah. yeah. Um, but still dead center in the same area you would go underneath the horn. Uh -huh. um, and I feel like that helps my shrimp float upright. Okay. It does rotate in the current. Yeah. That horn, you ever know, sometimes they'll twist. Yeah, and it'll spin. definitely kind of lay on its side even. Yeah, this will force them upright in that current, in that swimming position. And then two, um, you know, maybe it stays on the hook just a hair longer to give me that shot to get out. Right, right. If I'm going to use a shrimp. But like I said, it's not my preferred bait just because i'm going to go through so, so much of it gets and i'm already going through so many fiddler crabs man some days you gotta you know what it, you know, if you don't have bait a you gotta use what works and some days you gotta use it just because it's what's available right i just texted my buddy he's he sent me he hasn't texted me back yet but there was a place last year he found he could order fiddler crabs from florida and they were cheap Super cheap. They weren't very big, but he was—he had like a fiddler farm in his in his garage, just keeping them alive with with heat lamps. And uh, I mean, he kept them alive for weeks. And we were—I was going over it, there. They're pretty easy to keep alive, and that's why I talked about you know grabbing like six hundred or right. so. 
a little bit of moist soil. Um, the only thing you really, you don't want too much water in there because yeah. um, they will, they will drown. You want to make sure they've got dry soil as well. Um, but man, they stink. Yeah, the ammonia stink. from the waste byproduct, you know, you're just going to want to make sure that uh, you change that out every now and then. Right. You'll be the only one going in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, I, that is one thing I do remember is his garage was a little stinky. And he, I think he did change it out quite a bit. But it was nice to – because th- there's times where – like you said, you'll dig them, which is awesome. But for, it'll, they'll go dormant up here and get hard to get unless you're digging them. And that will start – I've started using too. Have you messed around with the mud crabs at all um, the past fishing form at all, like flipping I, oysters for mud crabs? Just because I don't, I, I don't like going to go – It's to me, that's a harder bait to get as many. Right, for sure. And I'm going to have to get in the mud and flip up rocks and whatnot. They're great. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I've met guys that swear they catch bigger sheep's head on mud crabs than they do. But I got to tell you, in my experience so far, if I use a mud crab and it's a bigger mud crab, the smaller sheep's head just crushes it the same yeah. as the bigger one does. And as far as I'm aware, there are not any shops that sell them. Yeah, you can't buy them. That's for sure. And the they they are definitely harder to get more of than than the fiddler crab. Uh, I, I think the I won't turn one up though if I have it if it happens to yeah. poke its head out while we're getting them. For sure, for sure. And I'm gonna save it because I think maybe it's a possibility I'm gonna get the big sheep right, head on it. Right, but right. So far, it just seems to be whatever bait. If the bait ends up in front of a hungry sheep's head, he's yeah. still gonna. He's gonna eat. It. He's still gonna whack it. Definitely. Um, and I, that's one I forgot about. I will use blue crab. Too. Blue crab. Yeah. yeah. You quartering um, it up. But you're gonna need a pair of a shears yeah. and scissors, and you're gonna need to do some trimming. Um, if you when you open up a blue crab and you crack the top of it, if you don't, you notice how that body that there's two halves and each half has kind of segments in it, where you can see the mm. grooves and the lines on the top. Um, you try to follow it with scissors and the reason you want to use scissors or at least in my opinion is you don't crack the shell any further yeah. than if you try to break it um, that'll help hold the meat in and then I will cut the legs off instead of breaking them that way I'm not pulling any of the meat okay. out of the leg cavity but I'll cut them right at the joint and then I'll take that hook and go in at the joint the flexible cartilage that is there that is not part of the shell that allows that crab to move right. is soft you can slide that hook in, and then I'll slide it through with the, the curve of the hook and point coming back out the other way. Um, and you're going to, you know, you can use smaller pieces because if you use too big of a piece, they're just going to pick around it. Yeah. Um, it's going to be hard to get the fish to, or get a hook into a fish um, if you do something else. I know some guys like to use those smaller live bait hooks, but I like that longer shank just because there's so few places to get the hook into that fish's mouth. I mean, if you've sheep's head fish before, I can't tell you how many times you get tight to a fish and you're cranking and you set that hook and you can literally feel where that hook was on the back of the teeth and it just slides off. You yeah. can feel it slide off of those teeth. That's so um, fun, especially so on the slow days, man. A little bit longer shank for me really makes a big difference in getting that little bit of an extra opportunity because, I mean, I can't tell you how many of them are just barely hooked through the lip when you get them up to the boat. You're like, gosh, I can't believe I got you because there was just a little sliver of lip on that 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 hook went through. Yeah, man, those fish are – I'm surprised you can even – we can even hook any of them, you know, with how softly they bite and how hard they are to get the hook in. But uh, we'll we'll sweep. Well, let's let's, uh, – I can't remember if there's – oh, one other thing I want to ask about this. Do you use your electronics much? I know you use it to find bottom, but do you ever mark schools of sheep's head and like – Oh, pay, absolutely. Pay good- your electronics are crucial. Um, you, I can't tell you as a person who hasn't done it what exactly to you're going to look for. I can give you an idea of what to look for, but the best way you're going to learn to do it is get out there – you're looking for your larger marks because there's a lot of smaller fish. Your ringtails, which is a member of the, you know, that porgy family, they got teeth very similar to a sheep's head. Right. You're gonna have black sea bass. You're gonna have other smaller fish there. So you're looking for your larger signatures. Gotcha. Um, and you're looking for a lot of them. Um, you know, I'm looking for 20, 30, 40, 50, or more signatures before I'm even gonna drop down um, into an area. When you get up to a reef. Um, take your time, drive very slowly around the reef structure itself. 
Um, they move around. Um, even once we've located them, they seem to come in and out, um, especially if you're not chumming. They seem to, you know, you'll get everybody gets a few bites, and then for five, ten minutes, nobody gets a bite. Right. Like she right. said. And then you'll see them come back on the screen, and you're like, okay, everybody get ready. You're about to get bit. Like, and you, in my head, I just kind of picture them kind of meandering and moving around. And it's amazing that with clear water out there, that they don't just swarm to it when it drops down, like a million snapper or some of your trigger fish do, where you drop baits down and, you know, you mark a good number of them. And then once you start catching them, your screen absolutely fills up with fish because everything in the area you know responds but make sure you move around you're going to look for those bigger signatures and then when you hook up if you have the opportunity to be somewhere where you can see your screen look what's down there look what those marks look like and then when you go to your next area or your next time out try to look for that similar size and quantity of mark on your on your screen side scan if you're looking for structure um, and you haven't, and if you have it on your boat, that is probably one of my favorite tools. Uh, even dock fishing, if you're going to dock fish, right. she said, I can go along those docks and I can go, nope, 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 fish, yeah, nope, nope. That might be a school of redfish, or that might be trout based on where they're sitting. And that side scan, especially if you're not sure where you're looking or where you're going, can really help you locate structure and determine what's up under what kind of fish or how many fish are up underneath the dock so that you don't just sitting down there spinning your wheels and blindly guessing just because i'm at a dock it's got a whole cheat set you know, <laughs> if, you, if you fished enough you know that man some docks are magic and some docks are crap it's funny man and, and for different species too like just because you catch redfish mm-hmm. on doesn't mean it's gonna be a sheep's head dock so right right very much so oh. Well, sweet. Well, let's uh, share a little bit with me about your wintertime inshore fishing. Um, I, I, more and more people are becoming intrigued about the the near shore, the sheep's head. I think with the, just more and more inshore pressure, more and more skiffs, and just tougher and tougher to to get after it in the inland waters. The the near shore game is becoming much more popular. But for a little bit, let's talk about what you know. Maybe it's blown a little bit. You got to stay inshore. What are you doing inshore this time of year? So. You know, a big thing that a lot of people want to do this time of year, you you do this, is the redfish. Right. You know, uh, kind of a neat thing happens. Um, I'm not sure. I can't speak for your area. I'm going to say this, and I'm speaking for my area right. alone. Um, but most of the bait is gone. Most of, you know, your your mullet, your menhaden bunker, pogies, whatever you want to call them for your area, um, greenies, most of the shrimp are gone. Crabs are going dormant. Um, so a lot of the things that the porpoise would like to eat are gone and they, they begin to shift their focus predominantly to the redfish and speckled trout populations. The speckled trout don't seem to have much of a defense mechanism. They kind of don't really seem to do anything all that special as far as I can tell to avoid predation. Um, but the redfish do, um, when the water temperature starts dropping below 60 degrees and particularly below 55. The phytoplankton, microorganisms, and those things that often cause our water to be cloudy or the visibility to be less, um, they die off. And there are days when it's nice and calm where I have five to six foot of visibility. And on those days, um, you know, we're going to get up in the shallow water. The redfish, in response to that predation, they school up. The, you know, so let's say that in for this school of fish its home range might be a 400 yard stretch where they move back and forth and they're all spread out and they move around and during their feeding patterns and they might get some congregation at low tide and then as the water goes up they disperse around the oyster bars or back into the creek or into the grass or whatever that particular school does for that area right um as it gets colder they come together and group up and they will stay shallow for the most part to avoid predation the more eyes the less likely they are to get you know that dolphin to creep up on them right um and i have found that the colder it gets the bigger the schools get um so right now you know a lot of these schools are probably breaking up into smaller pods and actually actively feeding but if it gets really cold we'll get 
I won't call them super schools because that sounds like a YouTube trendy <laughs> word, but um, they they will group up and instead of just this one school coming together, two or three schools, four schools in some cases, will come together and their sole focus then becomes staying alive, right. um, stay, avoiding predation. And that's a really cool thing to see, but it also can be an incredibly frustrating thing to see as well. Because just because if you can see them, they can see you. And this is a, this is a case where long casts become crucial. Um, and I'm going to be using seven and a half, and in some cases, eight foot medium lights. I'm going to knock my braid down to 10 pounds, 15 pounds tops. And I'm going to be using probably a 2500 series with 10 to 15 pound, 12 pound liter, fluorocarbon liter, often five to six feet of fluorocarbon. Um, I prefer to tie an FG knot just because it allows me to go through the guides without clanking and losing some casting distance where if right. you use a, new, a uni or some of the other connection knots that are a little bit larger. For those of you who don't tie it, it is a hard knot to tie. It's one you're going to want to practice to learn. But once you get it, it's pretty quick and it's very effective. And, you know, even with my best uni knots, man, if I, I get stuck on a rock or something and I decide I got to break it off because I can't get it, more times than not, I come back with braid. I can't tell you if I've tied that FG knot right, I'm coming back with a bunch of leaders still. Yeah. That's one of those knots that's incredibly tough to break. For sure. Um, but these fish are catchable. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is getting too close. You know, really take your time, come in quiet, come in slow. Look in the same areas you catch redfish during the warmer months. They may not be on this point and this oyster bar and this stretch of grass line. They're gonna find one area that provides the best protection or they're the most comfortable in, come in slow, Look for variations in the water. A lot of times, if you've been doing this for a while, you probably know what I'm talking about. You can see little movements in the top, on the water, even when it's calm. You can see little variations in the water, or if it's windy, I can see the water, maybe the wave pattern slightly broken up or moving in a different direction to give me an indication that those fish are there. Right. You know, really, really watch and, and come in slow. And then instead of, oh, man, there's – there's 50 fish right there and you get excited and you make that cast and you land in the middle of all those fish <laughs> and they scatter. Work the edges. Work you know, work the outsides of those schools. Work the edges um, by not spooking a bunch of fish all at once. That'll give you an opportunity to pick out the sides. And in my experience too, um, some of your biggest fish are going to be your outliers, the fish that hang out on the outer edges of the school. Um, sometimes even a little bit further away from the other fish. They, uh, I think it's just a confidence thing. You know, when they get to that 28 to 32, 34 inch size range, that upper limit mm -hmm. of what is a juvenile fish, um, I think that they may not be as concerned about predation and they just, they may not be as tightly bunched up, but, you know, really work those edges and you may be able to pick off instead of catching one or two, you know, fish out of a school. Some days you can get, 15 fish, 20 fish, and, and just like any other day, you know, for some sure. days you can't do anything wrong and they're just eating. And some days they've got locked jaw. Yeah. Um, be frustrating. One of the neater tricks I have found over the years is if you've flat fit fish for schooling reds in the winter, and particularly if there's a mixture of sand or a lighter colored bottom mm -hmm. where you have a darker sediment on top, have you ever noticed the potholes? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. So that's those red fish digging in the bottom looking for food and when it gets really cold it's often marine worms um the worm in particular that they eat in our area uh tends to look like a tapeworm yeah that little it's, white one that kind of dangles on the surface or not on the surface on the surface I, of the sand i don't know that i've ever i don't know that i've seen them on the surface and that it may be the same thing but it's they can be really long yeah um but they're super super thin they're all they're like an opaque almost clear okay color um, and if they're cold and I notice a lot of fresh potholes, not ones where they've kind of indentations where the sediments filled back in on them, but where I can see kind of that white spot where they kicked up the sand. Yeah. Um, Z-Man makes a, a bait called the Trick Shot Z. And it's kind of got this little triangular 
tail to it. I'm going to pull it up and drop it in here. Floats up, and there's a couple of colors that are pretty close to that uh, to that worm that they eat. And I have found that if and it's such a slow presentation, that's another thing. You know, this water's cold. These fish are cold. They're a product. Their temperature is the environment. If you're darting a bait around, they're not going to hit it. They're not going to hit right. a bait that's zooming all over the place. That's so unnatural. So we're going to, you know, barely, I might just be jiggling my rod tip enough to get the bait to flutter or dead sticking it even. Um, big fan of Procure. I think that scent and taste are always a big thing. Um, I'm not a big proponent of Gulp. I, it works. It certainly has its place. Um, but it doesn't last, and I might as well be using live bait, in my opinion, at that point, just for as much as you got to pay for a pack of gulp and as many fish as I can catch. But with that, like, it's a 4.2 inch, um, and I'm sure there are other baits out there, but particularly with that Elastec, it causes the bait to stand up and float, and when they get super, super picky in the cold, that's one of the few baits I can consistently get them to eat. Um, I'll normally rig it on a net head. Yeah. Um, and if I'm around oysters, I'll use the weedless net head. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small hook. I, I do wish they had an option, maybe with a little bit bigger gap on it, um, on that hook. But I've got to get bit first before I worry about anything right, else. Right, exactly. And really, really slowing that presentation down. Um, I don't use as many paddle tails or swim baits this time of year. It tends to be flukes um, and downsizing downsizing smaller baits slower presentation trd is always one of my favorites for cold water presentations mm -hmm. um that damn that bait catches everything i i, I don't That's think the dumbest bait it but it does <laughs> it it catches everything it last winter i was fishing with flat day flat yeah uh -huh. and uh i strike we were fishing up in the river and i caught a 42 incher on really in in january i think it was january i think it was coming up yeah okay. um Elephants eat peanuts, and, right? Yeah, elephant. That, that, I live by that. Everybody, you know, especially if you get clients and you're using shrimp and they're baiting their own hook. They, you know, they get the group that wants to bait their own hooks. Right. They're always going for that biggest shrimp in the live one. I've got guys. It it doesn't necessarily have to be right. the biggest bait right. in the world. Some of the biggest fish I've caught even have been on tiny, tiny little baits. Definitely. Particularly in the winter. You think about fly fishing, you think about um, people fly fishing for tarpon. You know, you're throwing a tiny, tiny little fly to this 200-pound fish, and they'll eat it up. So it's it's so much more presentation than anything. It's putting it in front of the right. fish and giving them the opportunity. One of the things I share with people a lot in the winter is always you, you got to let that fish feel like they've found what they're going to eat, especially in the winter. Like if you force something on them when it's cold and when they're a little agitated, they're not going to eat it. But if you let them feel like they found it, then, then usually the – the outcome is, you know, in our favor. So, um, I pulled up yeah, and dropped very much. So. I pulled up and dropped in the, uh, the trick shots on the screen a little bit while you were talking, but so I'll, I'll drop in here again. I have not, I fished a lot of Ned baits and I fished a lot of the Z man, smaller baits and whatnot, but I've not fished this one and I've seen it, but I really like that shape of it. Like kind of like a, it's not a paddle tail, but more of like a, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. It's just, it's almost like a little diamond or triangular tail. Yeah. It's just, it, doesn't it, it's got a lot of movement if you work it fast but that's not what it's there for right right this time of year i'm just simply trying to mimic that worm if it's got a little bit of current and it stands up it'll kind of flutter and wiggle like that worm might be doing yeah um and i and i, I hate that i can't remember the color off the top of my head but i never can either it's kind of that <laughs> light brown opaque um i think i see it right here but i'm gonna click on it and see if i can get the name of it probably not yeah, it doesn't have the name. And and not every school of fish eats that. This right. is more so for your flats fish. Definitely. This isn't for your for your creek bred fish. You know, the, in the winter time, it doesn't always have to be um, a flat to catch redfish. Right. There are lots of schools that live in in deeper water bends or along rocks or underneath docks. Um, fish that I find that uh, live near deeper water tend to eat more glass minnows mm -hmm. um, because that is the major food source that is in our water system for the winter. Um, we do have some shad, uh, some juvenile shad in a couple of places up in the rivers and whatnot, but it's it's that, that glass minnow until that first push of menhaden comes in or, you know, the mullets start getting big enough. A mud minnow is always a great option too. Um, live bait, shrimp, 
Um, I do find that some of the winter redfish, particularly flats redfish, will not respond to a live shrimp like most other redfish will. Right. Um, but if you're going to throw at them, you're going to want to throw as light a rig as you can and still get to them because if you're going to throw a big one ounce lead at them or a three quarter ounce lead or a big cork and it splashes into the water, these fish are gun shy and the increased fishing pressure also, you know, they, they're, they're wary of boaters now, not just dolphins. Right, right. Uh, so you're going to really want to focus on making a softer cast, making that longer cast and, and rule of thumb as light as you can get away with um you know i know some guys that will knock it down to six yeah i don't like six i don't like anything below 10 because i still want to particularly if it's really cold i want to land my fish in a reasonable amount of time to where i'm not putting any undue stress on that fish when it's not eating much and it's already cold and the water temperature's down um I don't think it's quite as dangerous as when it's 90 degrees outside and the water's in the upper 80s and, you know, you really work a fish forever and then that fish builds up that lactic acid and the lower oxygen levels and dies. Right. Um, but still, I don't want to fight a fish forever. And the other side of that is if I fight a fish for 10 plus minutes in a school of big redfish, he's running all over the place, kicking up mud and splashing and he's spooking all the other fish in the area too. So I do like to try to get him in a reasonable amount of time right. to, to limit the amount of commotion going on. For sure. Uh, um, and if you're fishing with a buddy too, sometimes if you get a good day with those fish are turned on, you know, don't let your buddy, make sure your buddy's not just standing there and watching. You know, sometimes those fish will follow each other. And if you can make, be ready with that cast, sometimes you can pick off another one because they'll be following them in. So don't Definitely. just, you know, your shot's not blown. Your shot may be coming as that fish approaches the boat. So um, I can't tell you how many times somebody's made a cast. Your fish has got a group of fish that's following them. And you throw in there, and they're so curious as to what's going on or what that fish has found that you have an opportunity to get another fish on and get that, that double or get them that fish as well. Um, jetties, you know, a lot of – I love fishing the jetties in the winter. Uh, we have a rather large jetty here in Charleston. i something like two and a half miles oh wow um at both ends um we are one of them the larger seaports um i i think we're like number seven i think yeah. as far as the amount of uh, commercial traffic that we get um but we catch redfish of all sizes out at the jetties in the winter you know not all at least in my area not all of the bull redfish are gone yeah. Um, most of them are gone. They're out in the ocean or they've migrated. You know, some of the groups will migrate south. Um, but the last time I was out, the last two times I've been out there, we've caught 40 plus inch fish yeah, while that's we're awesome. trout fishing. That's awesome. Um, so, and as far as live bait, we catch our shrimp, or at least most of the guides and uh, do in Charleston. We're fortunate enough to have a white shrimp population that holds off year round and we're allowed to deep hole shrimp. Um, I don't believe you're allowed to do that in North Carolina. No, Is that we're correct? not. Mm -mm. I'm sorry, bro. That's a wonderful thing. I know, I know. Um, We've got a buyer shrimp, so like six dollars a dozen. Text real quick while we're chatting. Yeah. Of one throw the other day, and it was like 350 in one throw. Oh my gosh. Um, and we keep them in pens and stuff around the docks and whatnot, just to. Uh, actually, I'll probably wait and send it till I got to dig for it. Yeah, you're good. You're good. You're good. Look at my phone, but. Um, so live shrimp is a big part of what we do, but there's also a lot of mullet still. Um, some of the mullet, the big giant mullet, you're not going to, I mean, it's not really what I'm looking to use, right. but there's always some mullet for whatever reason that don't migrate. And if you take the time on your warmer days, you might see one or two jump. They're not going to be up on the surface like you would normally see them. Right. Uh, during the warmer parts of the year, they tend to hug the bottom. And it almost looks like the bot, like a dark mass moving along the bottom in the shallows, you know, two, three, four feet. Um, but I use a lot of mullet this time of year too. Yeah. Um, anything from you know little finger mullet, about like this, on up to some of the trout that I'm trout I'm fishing for right now. I'm using eight inch mullet. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. So there's a lot of them out there. You just got to take your time, go slow. Low water is always the best time to find them. 
Um, we have it, those schools, super, though, but it's just so hard to freaking find them. It's always when I'm sight fishing or something, I'll see them, and I'm like, I wish I could catch them and save them, but I've never been able to, like, I've never once thrown a net in the winter for mullet and used them, so. Oh, I man, think we, we all just have just enough, the, your water's a little bit warmer than ours, and that there's more than We are, on. like, what, so, right now, my water temperature is, like, 62, 63, um, for the most areas, some of the flat is that inshore, 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 okay. sixty-five. Yeah, um, it's we were as far down as fifty-one um, back when we had we had a period of like 42, 43 degree rain where it rained for two days yeah. and the water temperature plummeted and um, but it's come back up with the warm weather. Um, but we do have mullet. Um, not, you know, I'd say 98% of them are gone. Yeah. You know, when sure. that mullet sure. migration happens, most of that biomass mass leaves us. But if you take the time and then go around at least here and probably more so as you go down through Georgia, I imagine it probably gets better. Um, but we do have them and I don't, you know, cut mullet for redfish on the flat scent, crack crab. Um, again, with that crab, I still, like I talked about with the sheep's head, I'm using shears. I'm going to quarter a crab at that right. point, but I'm still going to cut the legs off instead of breaking them. And the reason I take the legs off is if you get into a smaller fish or the fish grabs the legs, you know, it doesn't grab that hook. That way I'm making sure that I've got the meat there and the part that the fish right. is going to grab is right. going to hook that. Um, it's probably the most important thing to tell you those cut the legs, don't leave them on. Yeah. Cut them, sure. don't break them. For sure. If you break them, you run the chance of pulling that meat out or breaking the shell up and then it just won't hold together. For sure. And I kind of another neat trick too is if you're using live blue crab, um, I take pliers and crabs regenerate their limbs. It happens all the time. Most people, when they get them, if they take the legs off, they grab the arm and they twist. It. Right. When you do that, you rip the meat out of that chest cavity of that crab crab's going to die yeah if i can get the natural response of the crab if you crack take a pair of pliers and pinch them right there on the bicep the crab will drop the claw really it drops it all by itself wow i did not Both know that that's them, cool and i can keep them alive for weeks wow like that where because i didn't rip this part of the meat out and and damage the crab they'll stay alive I will drop, you know, some shrimp down in my bucket right, and stuff, right, right. and I'm not letting them starve to death. But then, too, I can put them in my tanks, and when I'm going to get them, I don't have to worry about, look, you know, losing a freaking finger. Or right, right. Finger just pull all. the crab out. Because when you're fishing, yeah, anyways, even if I'm taking out. whole crabs out there, I'm taking the claws off and quartering them anyways. So I've never, I mean, I've sheep said fish. I've tried fishing the claws and whatnot. Maybe I've had, I've missed some bites, but I don't use the claws. I can't ever I recall catching fish on. Yeah, just the quartered body. Yeah. Just the just the body, um, and I've used live blue crab before for bull reds. Yeah, um, particularly peelers. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can get your hands on on peelers, um, they work really well. But typically during peeler season, I'm going to use them for big black drum. Yeah, like that's Definitely. the the time period when the black drum are here. I feel like it's um, got to have something to do with why they're here when the peelers are around. Like it, it, we we have a couple of areas in late March and April where we get bull redfish up in the shallows mm -hmm. and that is what they're up there for, for those peelers they are up there for the for the crab molds yeah um and that's the cool. first influx of food um but that's that's another topic that's a whole other topic I quickly deviate yeah no you're good i definitely want to have you back on throughout the seasons and uh talk about your fisheries you know as the season changes for sure We've got a little bit of time left. Give me a little short uh, snippet of kind of your trout fishing this time of year, and, and we'll close it up and, and and get another one recorded in the spring or something. So this is one for me that is a lot. This is this is kind of my one of my favorite things to do is I love targeting big trout. Yeah. It is not something that most clients want to go do. It is not a you know we're not go, I'm not going to go catch a pile of trout. It's something we can do. And we do a lot. We catch a lot of trout in the winter. You know our water stays warm enough. Um, particularly targeting them in you know, deeper creeks, deeper water, um, but targeting big trout this time of year. I can put baits out, um, whether I like, I prefer to catch them on artificial lures, right. but I'm enough of a junkie right. that I'm going to try anything, just about yeah. whatever I can do to get that big trout bite. Um, one of the misnomers I think about trout 
that people may not realize is that they sit out in a lot more current than most people give them credit for. For sure. Um, a lot of my big trout come out of the main rivers. They come out of areas that tend to have higher flow rates and these trout will hug the bottom. Um, and they'll, they'll hold the, I don't know what your system looks like, but a lot of my areas you have ledges, Mm -hmm. not 10 foot ledges, but maybe little three foot, two foot ledges where it goes from like 14 to 17 or nine to 12 or six to nine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they move up in the shallows. In my experience, if it's really cold and you see a trout up shallow, super shallow, it's almost impossible to get that fish to eat. They're up there sunning, they're warming up. Um, But they'll sit down there and you got to think of the, the current like a conveyor belt system. Those glass minnows and food sources, bait cannot expend too much energy swimming against the current. So they're going to swim with the current. Right. And these trout will sit on the bottom, literally belly down on the bottom. It makes them very difficult to mark. Um, side scan is a little bit easier to mark them with if you know what you're looking for than it is traditional sonar because traditional sonar, they're literally flat down on the bottom, whereas side scan, I can kind of get a little bit of a profile yeah, of it. Yeah. And on a really big trout maybe a shadow i might get a little excited if i see yeah, the shadow, see the shadow one, you're but, like Whew. um but they're sitting down there they're sitting deep i'll throw you know a lot of the traditional stuff your suspending baits your your twitch baits for us twitch baits are a little difficult they're not designed to throw in heavy current right um they don't sink fast enough and i have found that you know trying to add weight to them helps a little bit split shots i don't like because it changes the the way the bait sinks and you don't get that flutter um, big s- plastic swim baits, um, you know, five inch, even up to six inches. You're not going to catch a ton of fish doing it, but you're looking for a big that bite. bite. Yeah. Um, but what we talked about too, with the mullet, um, I'll use mullet, uh, bigger mullet. And it's a very, you talk about have patience. You're talking about unscrewing your drags down to the point where you could almost lift the spool off the reel. <laughs> um, and you're hooking, I'm using six odd hooks. Even. Yeah. Um, and 10 to 15 pound test fluorocarbon, right? Um, FG knot, so I can have six to eight feet of fluorocarbon and split shots just enough to get the bait down on the bottom. There's two ways, two or three ways to do it. You can do the, um, the hook down near the anal fin. Um, you can do the hook through the mouth, you know, in the mouth, out the top, Mm -hmm. or you can do the other hook, uh, on the back basically the same spot above the anal fin, but just on the top half of the tail. Right, right, right. Um, and when you get a bite, it is not as aggressive as you might think, you know, for a big fish. A lot of times, even this, you're just going to see the rod tip start going like this, and you'll have the drag so loose that it just starts swimming away. With it. Right. And you're going to let the fish swim. Because if he's going to, if it's a big trout, I prefer the tail hook method because I feel like that allows me a less of a chance to gut hook a fish because I'm going to give this fish a minute, two minutes to eat this bait. My hope is, is that I'm going to feel him chewing that bait because a lot of times they'll pick it up in an area and we've even seen some of the big trout where you get a fish that grabs a, a, a mullet mm-hmm. and he may have let's say he bit it in 12 feet the fish swims up shallow and what i believe that fish is doing is he's not the only big trout that's down there and we've seen where he'll come up shallow or obviously she if it's a really big trout but she comes up shallow and there'll be other larger trout trailing that fish i think they're trying to take it and the reason the fish is coming up shallow to eat is, to, to is have it trying himself. to get away from the other <laughs> fish to have an opportunity to eat that bait. And you've got to you've got to wait until they start chewing it, and then you're going to have you, know, you tighten that drag back up. In some instances, these fish are running 30, 40 feet away from us, and then coming all the way back after the bait was 70 feet from the boat to begin with, coming all the way back down the side of my boat. Wow. And we're watching them swim past us and they're going looking and then they finally stop whenever they get to a place that they're comfortable and then they eat that bait. That's and the crazy. hope is, is that I'm getting the hook in that bait, in that fish um, before 
it swallows the whole thing. Because the last thing I want to do is kill a big trout. Right, right. And very, very few um, of these trout have I ever got hooked. Yeah. If I tail hooked them. For sure. If For I've sure. nose hooked them and I let them eat it, I am. I have had some problems with gut hooking. Stinger hook sounds like a great idea. It's a not. Gut hook. Guaranteed not a good idea. Hook, yeah. I, I, that ended very quickly. Yeah. Um, I put a couple of treble hooks into a fish, into bait, and it went right in the gut, and I, I just couldn't do that. Right. You know, these right. are big trout are, are few and far between, and for the sport, I am not going to looking to kill them. So if you do it, please stay away from the stinger hook. Yeah, it's just, definitely. It's not going to work out for that fish. A lot of guys It'll up get here. You the, you'll get it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. A, lo- a lot of guys up here will fish. They'll f- like will slip float for trout fishing live baits on a slip float. But a lot of guys that are fishing the shrimp will fish treble hooks. And, and again, a lot of guys that are slip floating, they're they're looking to fill the cooler up. You know, it's not necessarily used as a. There's a few guys using it as a big trout method. Um, I, I catch a lot of big trout on slip ports yeah, too. The slip um, port, but I use up to like three eighths ounce lead on them. Yeah. Um, because of my current. Right, right. And I might be fishing that slip court down 12, 15, 18 feet. Right, right. Um, and I, I have found that if the big trout's hungry, it's just as happy to eat a shrimp. Right. Um, but what that, what, what that mullet does is it eliminates most of the small trout. For sure. And I say most because three weeks ago, we caught an 18 and a half inch trout on a six inch live spot. Wow. And it swallowed. Wow. I, I can't even like the proportions of the mouth. We we sat there and looked at that fish and we're like, how? Like how did how did that go down the throat? Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was taller than your mouth is wide. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, but clearly Got that in the snake belly, jaw you effect. See that spot. Yeah, that's cool. Um, that's one yeah, of the I fish when I clean trout cool. for clients. Um, e- even smaller trout, you know, 14 to 15, you know, 17, 18 inch fish will have a lot of spot in their stomachs. Not and those fish a lot of times not bigger ones in their stomachs, but but smaller ones if they're if they're not fully, you know, decomposed yet, you can tell there's their spots a lot the of times. Spot is probably out of the non white bait. Right. Like, you know, mullet, greenies, right. menade and pogies, bunker, whatever you want to call them. That is my favorite one to use because it's all of the good stuff that mullet and other fish have. But they don't have any spikes. They don't have sharp gill rakers. Right. Flounder love them. Redfish love them. Trout love them. Um, they make a phenomenal bait. It's not an easy bait to come by, though, for me. It's hard to it's catch something multiple can... easily. It's the beauty yeah, of a mullet or minhead. It's not something I'm going to cast in right, right. a bunch of. Yeah, this, uh, the sabiki for me has been the best way. You know, when I'll pull up to a couple spots in the morning, I'll have some baits, and I'll throw a sabiki out with like tipped with some fish bites or something like that and try to catch myself some spots That's... and whatnot. Fish bites is what I used to. Croakers. Yeah, croakers and pinfish. Pin fish. And those will be my big yep. fish baits for the day. That's kind of usually how I go about it. I'm doing all this fishing talk, man. I got to start. I'm, I'm tired of duck hunting. I got to start fishing again. I'm like, <laughs> I want to be doing this. Um, just a few more days, though. But, man, thank you so much for chatting with us tonight. We'll definitely have you back on. Um, would love to maybe just have you on with the change of each season and kind of talk about your area a little bit. Uh, I- I'd be happy to do it, man. I, I always enjoy talking, and I feel like we barely scratch the surface on any of the topics we just talked. I know that's as we talked I mean, about each so one. I'm like, we need to through. just do one. Like, we need to come back and do like a sheep's head, a, a, a redfish, a, a, a trout. You know, so we'll we'll definitely we'll definitely do that for sure. Um, so tell people one I, I, more. I'd, I'd appreciate the opportunity. I, yeah, I, anytime, brother. Yeah, definitely. T- tell tell us one more time how people can find you. And again, I'm going to link it below, but but just for people that might have missed it in the beginning. Um, it's Redfin Charters. We're out of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it's inshorefishingcharters.com. Uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, um, there's links on there. You can also email me at uh, captjcarter at yahoo.com. Um, my Instagram is uh, fishmindedcharters. Um, or you can call me, uh, 843-725-8784. Any, any of those ways are great to get me. If I'm out on the water, though, and you call, uh, leave a message, and I will reach out to you um, as soon as I'm done with that client. Or shoot me a text and uh, let me know you're interested, and I'll typically respond back faster to a text and say, hey, you know, I'll be off the water at such and such time, and I'll give you a ring. Look forward to speaking with you. For sure, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. Guys, thanks again for tuning in. I forgot to mention this in the beginning, but if you do want more podcasts, we do have a Patreon account with a lot of extra podcasts out there. We're putting out new podcasts every week on Patreon as well. So go check that out. Uh, That'll be linked in the descriptions on the YouTube channel as well as the podcast. Uh, But again, thanks so much. You guys, thanks for listening, and we will see you all next week. Later.